Uh, well, for the past few weeks, we've uh, been in a series on service. Uh, kind of deviated from the Revised Common Lectionary, but interestingly, when I looked at what was in the Revised Common Lectionary for today's uh, passage, um, it was this passage from uh, the book of Luke, Luke 14, 4, 14 to 21, and also the epistle reading was 1 Corinthians 12, which we, uh, which we considered a couple of, of weeks ago. So it works perfectly as kind of the culmination of this series of messages on service. And so today's message is called Fulfilling Our Purpose, and our scripture reading is from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. You'll find that on page 834 or 1596 in the Pew Bible. I encourage you always to have the Pew Bible or to bring your Bible or to have your phone um, out and follow along with the scripture as we read and then as we go through it in the message. So Luke 4, beginning at verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you have spoken to us over these past several weeks. And as we look into your word this morning, to your example, to your proclamation of your purpose, may we be reminded and refreshed of our own purpose that you have um, anointed us with. And may we be courageous and obedient to fulfill that purpose. Open our hearts and our minds to hear your voice and to know your will and to willingly and joyfully obey it. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So in, in 1963, University Christian Church in New York put a sign on their door. Gone out of business. Didn't know what our business was. You know, several years ago, uh, there was a company that most of us grew up knowing very well, Kodak. What is Kodak famous for? Cameras, cameras, film. We all, you know, spent loads of money on on uh, Instamatic cameras and all those different things. And however, in the early 2000s, Kodak started to struggle. Yeah, they knew that their business was about cameras and photography, but the world in which we lived had changed and was moving into a much more digital age. And Kodak did not keep up with those changes. They forgot what their business was really about and kind of got stuck in a certain mode. And they actually filed for bankruptcy. I have read that they've been kind of coming out of bankruptcy and have kind of made some adjustments, but uh, for a time, they really lost sight of what their purpose was and what they needed to do to fulfill that purpose. And so we, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be reminded of the same thing. What is our purpose? What is the purpose of the church, the church individual, the church universal. George Santayana, I don't know if I said that right, but that's how it's going to be. Uh, George <laughs> said, imagine people going to work day after day without knowing their company's business. Yet that's exactly what happens when church members don't know what their church is trying to do. Fanaticism consists in redoubling your efforts when you've forgotten your aim. And today's scripture actually is a reminder to us of our purpose as a church through the one, Jesus Christ, who established the church as his living body in this world. We're looking at Jesus today. And the first thing we want to recognize is that Jesus knew his purpose. Jesus in this passage is clearly stating that he is Messiah. 
They gave him the scroll of Isaiah. He chose what part of Isaiah he wanted to read. He knew what he wanted to read. And Warren Wearsby tells us that Jewish rabbis interpreted this passage to refer to the, the Messiah, and the people in the synagogue that day knew it. They knew exactly what he was saying. And Jesus uses a form of speaking that his hearers would understand. He uses a parale parallelism as he speaks to them from this passage in verses 18 and 19 of the scripture I read, if you want to look at that. And so um, it, it kind of works in an in a, in a arrow-type format. And so he starts out with proclamation. Proclamation, I've been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Social justice, I've been anointed to bring release to the captives. Another word for that, which might be more relevant to our day, is refugees. And then he goes to compassion and mercy, to bring recovery of sight to the blind. The blind physically, the blind emotionally, the blind spiritually. And then he doubles back and says, social justice again, to set free those who are oppressed. And finally back to proclamation, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Doug Greenwald says, when the parallelism genre is used, the Hebrew list listener always looks for the center. There will be, there in the center will be found the culmination of the thoughts being developed. What the rabbi, the teacher, or the prophet most wants to underscore and emphasize as foundational to his overall message. To an observant Jewish culture where mercy to Gentiles is conspicuous by its absence, Jesus declares that the pivot point or epicenter of his ministry will be bringing God's mercy and compassion to those who have been systematically deprived of it. Greenwald continues, in this inverted parallelism, Jesus states that which he will now live out in his earthly ministry. He has come to both declare and pour out the mercy of heaven. These three passions, proclamation, social justice, and compassion and mercy become the plumb line for his disciples. His ministry mandates giving equal weight to proclamation and social justice driven by a core passion for bringing mercy and compassion. This is the three-part measuring rod that Jesus sets for himself, for his kingdom of God, and for his legacy, the body of Christ. It is a sobering challenge to implement his passionate purpose with an equal emphasis in each area. You see, Jesus came to say, I am a courageous, compassionate confronter. The Believer's Bible Commentary says that Jesus came to deal with the enormous problems that have afflicted mankind throughout history and presented himself as the answer to all the ills that torment us. And as I was grappling with this passage and reading it, a song uh, that I hadn't heard for a while kept popping up on the radio or on my YouTube feed. It's a song by an Irish group called Rend Collective, and it's called Rescuer. And I want to read the words to you. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shamed. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion failed. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He is friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, rest for those who strive. Oh, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Jesus declares, this is what I came for, to rescue those who are lost, who are hurt, who are in pain, who are marginalized, who are disenfranchised. He says to them in the, on that day in that synagogue, this is what I came for. And as we look at that, and as we consider his life, we need to be reminded that he commanded us to do the same thing. In Matthew 22, Jesus responded to the question about the greatest commandment. He says, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as, your help, as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He's saying if you love God and you love others, you will fulfill the purpose that God has for his people in first creation. You have the same purpose as Jesus Christ. We have the same purpose. And then later, in Matthew 28, Jesus gave the church, the new, newly becoming formed church, his body, their mission statement. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, if we look at those two commands of Jesus saying, this is your purpose, this is how I am commanding you, how my Father is commanding you to live, it's love God, love others, bring people to follow me, teach them who I am, what I've done, what I expect. And so every week when we're here and we say the Lord's Prayer, and we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is what it's talking about. It's not that we're saying, oh, in some mystical, magical way, make it happen. We're saying, God, use us to make your kingdom grow on this earth as you have claimed. It involves our actions toward the same people as Jesus ministered to. It involves proclamation, social justice, and compassion and mercy. It involves us saying the Spirit of the Lord is on us because he's anointed us to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And it's important to note that if you look at the passage from which Jesus read in Isaiah, he stops before the passage ends. Because there's another line that the Jews always love to hear. The day of the Lord's vengeance. You see, Jesus was coming to say, the Lord's vengeance isn't coming yet. I'm here to give mercy and compassion. Vengeance and judgment is for later. Mercy and compassion is for now. Bob Goff said this. Jesus spent his whole life engaging the people most of us have spent our whole lives trying to avoid. I want to read that again. Jesus spent his whole life engaging the people. Most of us have spent our whole lives trying to avoid. Henry Nowen, a very well-known Christian writer, said, For Jesus, there are no countries to be conquered, no ideologies to be imposed, no people to be dominated. There are only children, women, and men to be loved. And he called us to the same purpose that he modeled in his earthly life, that he declared in the synagogue that day. I'm anointed by the Spirit of the Lord, and he's anointing us with the same Spirit. We just celebrated Christmas. I know it seems like a long time ago. It's been a month. You know, at Christmas, we talk about what a blessing Jesus came to earth, to his creation. But Christmas didn't end with the manger in the stable. It didn't end there, it just began. And there's this great poem that has been set to music, and I understand that in past years that a double duet group has sung this piece, but it's worth contemplating, especially now, a month past Christmas, as to whether or not we've really engaged in what Christmas means. It's called The Work of Christmas Begins. And it goes, when the song of the angels is still, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people to make music in the heart. Bill Crowder in Our Daily Bread said, these are the ones Jesus came to rescue. Poor, brokenhearted, captive, blind, and oppressed. He came for people dehumanized by sin and suffering by brokenness 
and sorrow. He came for us. And those of us who are here today and we know we've been healed, sometimes we forget those who have not yet been healed. And we think, well, I don't think Jesus came for them. But the truth is that you will never look into the eyes of someone God does not love. That phrase has come across my Facebook feed multiple times in the past month. And in a, a country right now that is, is divided by hate and anger and condemning and harsh words, we need to be reminded that we will never look into the eyes or the Facebook page of a person that Jesus does not love. He chooses to love them and he wants to rescue them through us. How many of you are familiar with The Lion King? It's one of my uh, younger daughter's favorite movies because it came out the year she was born, so it's kind of like her movie. But uh, after, after Mufasa has been killed and Simba has run off and he's, he's out in the jungle and he's just all carefree playing with Pumbaa and Timon, Hakuna Matata, it's just all great out here. I'm just going to have fun for the rest of my days. And Rafiki, that strange little monkey, with the little rattling stick, comes to see him and challenges him about who he is. He takes him to the water and he looks in and says, who do you see? And, you know, you'll see your father. And he looks and he says, no, that's just me. And Rafiki says, look harder. And Simba is torn. He's conflicted. And he goes up to this little ledge and he kind of plops himself down and this vision of his father comes, Mufasa, the grand leader of the pride. And he says, Simba, you have forgotten me. And Simba's like, no, no, I haven't forgotten you. And Mufasa says, you have forgotten who you are and so have forgotten me. Because who was Simba to be? The king. Every year, for the past several years, statistics tell us that roughly 4,000 churches closed their doors in this country, with only roughly 1,000 new churches being planted. And most of the problems that churches face, in my experience, can be traced to forgetting, neglecting, distorting, or corrupting our mission. We forget who we are. That we're anointed servants of Jesus to bring the broken to healing and wholeness in, and we forget. And when we lose sight of our purpose to love God, to love others, and to lead, lead people into that saving relationship with Him, when we lose sight of that, we have forgotten Jesus. And it's sad to say, and kind of mind boggling to believe that there are churches of Jesus Christ across this country meeting just like we are today who have forgotten Jesus. Maybe you today, as you think about what you do in church, why you come here on Sunday, what, what we're doing, how we talk, what our thinking is, maybe we've lost sight of Jesus. We've forgotten that we're His body. And Rafiki says, when you look at this church, you should see Jesus. And Jesus today said, this is what I came for. And this is what I have anointed you to do. So today, we need to remember. To remember who we are whose we are, that we are the body of Christ, to remember what he created us to do. And yes, even with a, with a Disney movie character like Simba, to remember that it's not easy to do it, but that it's only when we choose to remember who we are that we come into the full purpose that we've been created for. Will you pray with me? Father, there
there are so many challenges um, and things that face us as churches today, as bodies of believers. And sometimes, Father, uh, we do so many things in our own ability and in our own thinking, and, and by doing so, we actually forget you. We forget the statements that you put in Scripture, the statement in Luke 4, the uh, love God, love others, make disciples. We've forgotten who we really are. And so today, Father, as we have spoken about service, about how you have gifted us to serve, created us to be the body of Christ. Help us remember, Father, may we remember as we leave this place today who we are and who you have created us to be, that you have rescued us in order to bring others to be rescued by you, to be the hands and feet that can show them what you have for them, what you desire for them. That you are indeed the way, the truth, and the life. That you love them. And that you have come to proclaim it, to bring justice, and to show mercy and compassion. May we truly walk from this place today and look like you, by your power and by your grace. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Will you please stand with me? And the song we're going to sing is a song of consecration and commitment. Take my life.